Now, we did not finish one of our buys last week. We got through a whopping two last week. I move quicker this week. But remember, last week we were talking through priorities and what, what is important to God should come first in our priorities, uh, not our to-do list, but God. And then we talked about the need for our time with God every day, but that is essential. Um, the third truth, in some ways you might say, what does that have to do with priorities? But it actually does, and it's a segue to our chapter this week. And that is the lie, my work at home, if you have the notes from last week, is the last one. My work at home is not as significant as the work or other activities I do outside the home. Now, again, this is a lie that uh, we wouldn't come out and say, but how, how do we live? Does how we live portray the fact that what I do in my home, I believe is important. If we listen to the world and to society in general, they give a lot more importance and emphasis to what you do in your career and what you do in your workplace. Um, yesterday was International Women's Day, right? And um, I am all for acknowledging the, the progress and the, the contribution that women make to our society as a whole. But many times, we overlook the quiet, tedious, midnight hours of working in a home setting. And the, the things we pour, if you have children at home, pouring into children, teaching them, ministering to our husbands, even if we do not have a husband or children, uh, the home aspect of taking care of our parents, of inviting people into our homes for fellowship. All of those things, sometimes we start to think that's a lesser thing, that's not important. And that will affect us in the long run if we're not careful, because we end up neglecting the needs at home for the needs that are pulling at us from other places. Um, so my challenge to all of us is remember your why. Most of us start working for the sake of our families, right? For the sake of our, our home. And so if we go back to our why, it should help us put those other things in their right place. If, if what I am doing outside of the home, even within the church setting or within ministry, God is not pleased if that undermines what we are doing in our own home. Um, I grew up in a pastor's home, and sometimes PKs grow up and have a bitterness in their heart because they feel like the church stole the parent, the dad. Um, and I can say by God's grace, my parents were really careful about that. They wanted to make sure that we knew that their home was their first priority. But what my mom and dad did is they made church a family thing. It wasn't, I'm leaving the home, I'm leaving you all here to do my work, to do my stuff at church. Now, of course, there are times when you have to do that. But they involved the whole family in ministering at church. And if my parents felt like, for instance, I went through a really difficult time in 11th grade, if they felt like I needed extra time with them, or my dad sometimes would come home during the day that year when I was really struggling, he would leave his office at church. He would leave what was going on there, which in hindsight, I know he had a lot going on but he would come to deal with me and my needs. And that spoke volumes to me as a, as a PK, that home is important. Let's look at the truths underneath it. Keeping our homes 
is an important way we glorify God and advance the work of his kingdom. Many times we think that we have to be outside of the home at church, doing things at church to glorify God and advance the work of his kingdom. But in reality, God created the home as the first place that happens. Now, let's look at 1 Timothy 5, 9 through 10. This passage was a challenge to me at first because I was like, I am not seeing how this passage reinforces the fact that we glorify God and advance his work at home. So let's read it. And I want to see if you can see the connection here. 1 Timothy 5, 9 through 10. It says, let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man. Now it's describing this widow, well reported of for good works. I can think of some widows like that in our church who have had a huge impact and continue to have an impact for the Lord. Let's look at the good works. If she had brought up children, if she had lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. Okay, when I first read that, I thought, okay, what does a widow and this list have to do with furthering the kingdom at home? Does anybody online or here looking at those verses, what does that teach us about the importance of our home? Thank you, Sister Rodine. It's the foundation. What I'm going to push, push a little bit on that to ask you, what tells you that it's a foundation in this list? Yes. Very good. Sister Rodine said in this, it shows that her work within the home is the foundation for all she does. And uh, it shows that with its listing, right? It's listed first, brought up children. But then, as Sister Rodine said, hospitality, washing the saints' feet, helping the afflicted, all of those things most likely were happening within her home. Definitely the bringing up of children, but all those things were, as Sister Rodine said again, they were kind of background things. They were supporting, they were strengthening the body of Christ. And here the word of God says, this is her list of good works. Many times we think of our, at the end of our life, our list of good works are going to be, I led a Sunday school class of 50 people. I did this and that, and all of those things are good. But here it tells us that God sees those background things within the home where you are ministering to your children and to those that are afflicted. Sometimes your children are, or your husband is the one that is in need of feet washing, helping the afflicted, strengthening. Good. Next truth. The work we do in our homes is strategic for the gospel. It's strategic for the gospel. Turn over just a few pages to Titus 2, 1 through 5. Again, I want our antennas to be up for the work within the home and its impact. Would someone like to read Titus 2, 1 through 5, either online or in person? Sister Rodine. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, there's a lot in these verses and we're going to look at it a little bit. First of all, looking at these verses, we need to understand this passage is not saying that women should only work at home or that our homes demand our round the clock care and attention. This, this verse is not saying you are not allowed to work outside of the home. It's not saying that we are solely responsible to do all of the work that needs to be done in the home. It's not saying that we are to work outside the home. We are not to work outside the home and be compensated for it. It's not saying that you are not to have a career or a job where you are getting paid. And lastly, it's not saying that women have no place in the public arena or that we should not contribute to our church, community, or culture. I hope we understand that's not what this verse is saying. But boy, these verses are saying a lot. Somebody tell me a couple things that you pull from this passage about what God's perspective is on women and the home. It's talking about the aged women, that they teach the younger women what? How to take care of their home. And there are some specifics here. What are some specifics of how they care for their home? Love their husbands. You can actually be taught how to love your husband. That's an interesting concept because many times we think of it as a feeling. But here you can be taught how you, how you can better love your husband, how to love your children. You can be taught how to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. That's an interesting phrase. Rodine, how did it say it in your amplified version? Uh, verse five. Makers of a home where God is honored, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Isn't that an interesting way to end that passage? What does blasphemy mean? I can see Sister Merle is thinking over here. I see the smoke coming out of here. Sister Merle, what do you have to say? And I don't know if, uh, if you're comfortable with either bringing out your mask so we can hear you that way. There we go. Okay, I was, I was thinking, um, it's hard to teach what you don't do yourself. Yeah. You know, so these women, um, if they're gonna help, if they're gonna, if they're gonna teach the, the young women to love their husbands and love their children, that means they have to love their husbands and love their children. Yeah. All you could teach, because you see the other women, they know you. So right. if you're not doing what you try to teach them, that's a waste of time. Right. You know? So you have to be um, uh, respectful. Like this is the uh, baby. The big Bible. Um, it says, teach the young women to be quiet and respectful in everything they do. They must not go about speaking evil of others and must not be heavy drinkers. I was just thinking, we're well, doing now to drink. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> we won't dive into that today. <laughs> but not to the wine, so that yes. means they were allowed to. <laughs> they should be they should be teachers of goodness. And these older women must train the young women to live quietly, to love their husbands and their children, and to be sensible and clean and spending their time in their own homes, being kind and obedient to their husbands, so that the Christian faith can be spoken against by those who know them. Yes, yeah, so that the Christian faith 
cannot be spoken against by those who know them. That is an interesting way to say what the King James Version says, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Um, many times we think of blasphemy as specific words that you could say. But remember, blasphemy is when you make light of a holy God. And you bring, just like worship shows the worth of God, blaspheming is the opposite. It takes away from someone's perception of God and their understanding of his greatness. What's interesting to me is that that is at the end of this list of what we as women need to be taught some of which has to do with how we are in the home. As Sister Merle says, we can't just teach it if we're not living it. But how we treat our family members, how we are within the home, as well as these other things listed, is actually going to either do damage to the gospel and to God's name, or it is going to lift up his name. And promote the gospel within the home if there is hypocrisy within the home if there is speaking one way but living another way the word of god is going to be actually blaspheming to your children because they're seeing a duplicity and we have seen this now i'm not saying if you have had children who have gone astray or turned away from the Lord, that it's because there was this in the home. There are many reasons why children make that choice. And that is their responsibility before God. But on the flip side, how, how much we should, we should be sober about our homes, that how we treat one another, how we live out the gospel in our homes can actually lift up the word of God in the minds and hearts of our children, or it can make it of no use, no effect. But then again, outside of the home, it makes a difference. God's word can be glorified or blasphemed. The passage is saying, our homes matter. We cannot separate our home life from our Christian life. The work we do at home has eternal value. Never forget that, ladies. When we are, again, we are in different seasons. We have different roles. But when we are doing things behind the scenes, when we are listening to the Holy Spirit's prodding in regards to our children, our husband, our parents, our siblings, we are doing God's work even if it's late at night, early in the morning, if we are laboring in prayer where no one sees for our family, we are doing God's work just as much as if we were standing on the platform on Sunday morning, ministering in some way. Let's remember this passage teaches the work we do, do at home has eternal value. The place we call home provides an opportunity to magnify Christ and bless others. There's a quote that I have thought of many times, and it can be convicting, but it can be motivating. The light that shines the farthest will shine the brightest at home. The light that shines the farthest will shine the brightest at home. Isn't it easy to pour ourselves into people outside of our home? I, I say this is so easy. It's easy to give of ourselves to those outside of the home, to, to uh, be loving, kind, forgiving to those outside of the homes. But it is an extra challenge within the home for our light to shine the brightest there. We can't do it on our own. We have to have the Holy Spirit's help. But let's understand that if we can live out Christ's example within our home, within our family, that's the light that will shine the brightest in this world. And, and so that is a segue to our chapter this week. 
Now, don't be worried at the thickness of the notes because this is going to be both this week and next week that we are going to talk through. Lies women believe about marriage and children. Now, I want to say before we start, it makes sense that the enemy would target the home because it is the foundation it is the foundation for society. It is the foundation for our churches. It is the foundation. My mom used to always say that things within our family and our home can bring the greatest joys and the deepest hurts. And so I understand as we jump into this area that there is heartache that we may feel. And um, there may be some that are thinking, you know, if I had known we were going to go into this area tonight, I may have checked out for the next couple of weeks, um, just because I know it can be a sensitive area. As we go through these things, first of all, I want to remind us, the accuser is the one who wants to use this to discourage and to pound us down and to say, look what you did, this is why. That's not the goal of this. That is the accuser speaking to you. All of us, as we go through this book, as we look into God's word, he will show us areas that in the past we would do differently if we could, all right? But God's purpose is that we understand his truth so that as we move forward in this life, we can live according to his truth and be set free. You know, God is not done with any of us. God is not done with any of our homes. No matter what has taken place or what, where we are, God is not, God is not done working or using our homes. And so our, our focus needs to be, don't listen to the accuser. Listen to the spirit. What is he showing us that we can incorporate into our lives right now? Um, and also let me say that there is nothing that is taught here that is being applied to any specific situation that I or anyone here is aware of. And so let's not be thinking, oh, that's probably why this happened or that's why that happened. There are many reasons why tragedies occur within families. The enemy is after the family. And so it's not our goal or purpose here to look at other people's situations and dissect it. We all, none of us know the whole story. And so let's look at our situation. Let's look at what God can do in and through us in our homes. All right. Okay. Lie number one. This is for many of you who in this last lie we talked about are thinking, boy, I don't have a husband or, a ch or children within the home. But the lie, I have to have a husband to be happy. Um, or if you're in the married season, I need a husband who will make me happy. And I don't have one. Okay. Now let's think about, let's process that for a moment. Disney, Hollywood, yeah, let it go, <laughs> let it go. But they would have us think that that is the ultimate in life, to have a husband and they lived happily ever after, right? What are some thoughts that can flow from this lie, I have to have a husband to be happy? Yes. Comparison. Once again, we look, we say, boy, they're, they seem to be happily married. If I had a husband, I would be happy too. Good. 
I am incomplete. Good, sir, Noma. Somehow I have not started living my fullest or I'm not living my fullest right now because I am not married or I don't have a, a happy a husband who makes me happy. Um, I had many years single as well. And the idea, and sometimes this gets put on us by other people who unknowingly are reinforcing this thought that you have to be married to be complete. You know, um, I used to kind of chuckle, but also shake my head when I had friends in my 20s that were getting married. And as soon as they got married, they were trying to find somebody for me. You know, like, okay, now it's your turn. When are you gonna go? And yes, yes. And they think that somehow you're broken and you need, we're gonna help fix you, you know. Let let me see, you're not you're not succeeding yourself, for, so let me see if I can help you in this area. So that can reinforce that thinking that maybe I am. I'm not fully complete right now. Kim, what were you going to say along that line? Oh, I was just saying that there are focuses on. Yes. Yes. It can be a social stigma, Kim said. I remember when I was again in my 20s and I would travel with an evangelist family. I did that for two years and helped teach their children. And we would do meetings in churches. I can't tell you how many times I was put at the children's table to, to help the children eat their meals while the adults sat and you know talked. And again, I don't hold any bitterness from that. I understand that. Uh, sometimes people haven't been in that situation, so they aren't thinking clearly about it. But sometimes society does kind of give you a stigma if you, you're you single for one reason or another. Anybody online? Yes. 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 <laughs> And and how many how many uh, single people have have said have can relate to this? Where people say they they mean it as a compliment, but they say, "Now why hasn't anybody snatched you up yet?" <laughs> and the implication is there must be something wrong with you if nobody has asked you know pursued you, or it doesn't occur sometimes to people that. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not going to marry just anybody who says they want to marry me, you know, um, it's a little crude, but uh, an old lady one told, old elderly lady once told me, and this is a good thing, she said, any old dog can find a mate, all right? <laughs> and it actually was an encouragement to me <laughs> that, you know, it's not the ultimate just to find a mate or just to find uh, a boyfriend or whatever. Anybody who, if that's what they think is their key to happiness, they can find somebody who will tell them what they want to hear and they will get themselves in a heap of trouble. Um, other actions and emotions, we're not going to wait too much longer on this part of it, but this can make someone chronically unhappy because that is their focus. I need this to be happy. I don't have it yet. I'm incomplete. And so you're chronically unhappy, chronically lonely, chronically not at rest in your spirit. Um, I, again, we call it the radar. You have a radar for, radar for men who all they are is on the hunt for a wife, you know, and it's, you feel like, oh, they're not interested in me because they're interested in me. They just want a wife. Did you know we as women can be like that too if we're not careful? 
we're chronic. That's all we're thinking about. And we're not at peace. We're not fulfilled. We're not happy. But we think it's because we don't have a husband. When really it's because we haven't let that go and found our happiness in a place where it cannot be taken away. Sister Merle, what do you have to say? Yes, please, honestly. I think so my sisters about right? Yeah. Um, so so we're saying uh, you will pray for you will pray with you. <laughs> <laughs> um remember, remember, remember that God says I'm not in the power. So you could have and I have many times to get into it. But if I'm God's child, I have to wait until God is okay. Yes. yes. So, and so I also think too, I'm a sister's wife, and I've seen my sister's unhappy because of so many people are not this one. Yes. So I'm like, I feel happy. We should say that. Yes. <laughs> so I feel happy. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so when I got this, is that you know, who am I to? And I'm like, okay, but you're supposed to be happy. So mm -hmm. I, is that what I really want? Yeah. And I'm saying, no, it doesn't have to be that way, you know. But I would rather um, know that the person I need is what God wants for me. Yeah. As I said, our Lord, He knows you, He can talk to you, and I can talk to you. And so we can get on because we know you. Yeah. You know, we know you. And so we can live together. But yeah. until then, I am not unhappy because I'm single. I am yeah. unhappy. And I think, I think Sister Merle is a wonderful, we have several in our church that are wonderful illustrations of the truth that happiness is not found in a husband. Mm -hmm. Happiness is not found in a person. Because if you marry somebody, say, they're going to provide my happiness. What you find out after you marry is that no human being can provide that happiness for you. Now, marriage is a wonderful blessing. If it's if we are walking, both walking with the Lord, it's it's a challenge. It's not easy, but it's a wonderful blessing. But even happy marriages are not happy because the other person makes them happy. It's because we have learned, whether single or married, where to find our happiness. And happiness is not what we should be searching after. It comes when we find friendship with the Lord. And, um, and so Sister Merle just said it's true that as a single woman, she has observed that even ladies who get married are chasing that elusive happiness. And they have struggles too. I want to read a testimonial out of the book a lady that is single. She said, I have struggled with the lie that without marriage, I have no value, that perhaps something is wrong with me, that I'm still single. Believing this lie has robbed me of the joy of serving God and others because I've been so absorbed with my own goals. It has taken me many years to trust that God is sovereign and that he has a plan for me. My focus now at age 40 is to spend my remaining years taking advantage of the many opportunities to serve him and allowing him to change me into the most Christ-like woman I can be. This life is so short. He has helped me have an eternal perspective so that the sorrows and disappointments of this world can be happily endured. My life is short. I can't wait to be happy and to be fulfilled in serving God till God brings me a husband. Uh, one thing I have learned is that if I am waiting on God for anything, my husband talked about the waiting. My waiting is by God's design, not by his neglect. So if this season of my life I am single, it is by God's design. It means that there are things that I can do in my singlehood that I would not be able to do married right now. 
Um, that was such a help to me as a single person. I had somebody give me the, the advice. You have so much love stored up in your heart. Don't save it for when you get married. Give your love to the people who need it right now. There are children, scores of children who are neglected and need love. There are elderly people who are homebound or for one reason or another, they need someone to sit with them in church. They need someone who can give them extra attention. And the list goes on and on. There are single moms that could use other singles to come up and help her and make a meal or help her with the kids. Singlehood is by design in the body of Christ. Many times we neglect that piece of the puzzle. Uh, when we are married, it doesn't mean that we don't minister to elderly people or help other neglected children. But when you are married, even Paul acknowledges that your focus is changed. You have people within your home that need more of your time and attention. So let me challenge us who are single or those that are single. I'm not anymore. <laughs> don't, don't belittle your singlehood. It may not last forever. So use this singleness, embrace your, your season. The truth being married or not married does not guarantee happiness. I think we talked about that. There is no person who can meet my deepest needs. No one and nothing can make me truly happy apart from God. This is important for us just to take, to take the time to look at. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 8. Now, this is some strong language here, but the truth cannot be ignored. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. Someone online that is willing to read this passage for us. Okay, I'll read. Thank you, Jeremy. Jasmine. It's Jeremiah 17, 7, verse, verse seven. verses 5 through 8, 5 through 8. 5 through 8, 17, 5 through 8, okay. Yes. Oh, let's get my Bible. Okay. This is what the Lord says. Curse is the one who trusts, is, who's, who trusts in man who depends on flesh for his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. He will be like a bush in the wasteland. He will not see prosperity when it comes. He will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him he will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream it does not fear when he comes it leaves it, its leaves are always green it has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit okay this is a rich passage, ladies, for all of us. Are you a picture person? Are you viewing this? Cursed, that's a hard word in the King James. Curses is the man who puts their, who, the person who puts their trust in man, who tries to find their strength in a man, who tries to find fulfillment. Because when you go searching after that in a husband, in someone else, what picture does this passage give of how you will be? Sister Marcia? No. You're not going to find peace. You're not going to be happy. And the picture here is being in a wilderness. I'm picturing like a tumbleweed. No, no flourishing. No no green, you're dried up. And have you ever tried to find your strength 
and your happiness in a person and you felt sucked dry, that's not where our strength and our joy comes. And a casualty of that is if we make the other person that, if we put that on them, we will suck them dry too. We will become very toxic where we are just putting on them expectations that they cannot meet. But the wonderful part of this passage is the part where it says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and your hope is found in him. If that is where your joy, your hope, your expectation is found, you're going to be like a tree that's flourishing. You're not going to be phased by drought, by circumstances. It doesn't mean that the actions of your loved ones, you're not going to feel. You, you will still, there is still a sense that in our relationship with our husbands or with people we love, they give us joy sometimes. And then they also can sometimes hurt. But the foundation of our happiness, if it is in the Lord, we will not be shaken. We can be single and be fulfilled. We're not always searching, grasping. If the Lord, as Sister Merle said, if the Lord in his kind, in his way, leads us to the one we should marry, we'll know it. And God's blessing will be on. And we, I, I can say this. Uh, I have no regrets for my season of singleness. Not one. And I wouldn't trade it in hindsight. Because it was God's design for me. If nothing else, those seasons of drought can draw us to a closer friendship with our Lord. If you are even in a marriage that right now there's heartache or it's, it's struggling, don't give up on that marriage, but say, okay, Lord, let, <laughs> say, okay, Lord, let this draw me to my knees. If through this, I can find in you my joy, my strength, then I'm going to be okay, no matter what happens. Yes. 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 a good and interesting perspective by Marcia that again I think I think what you would say was I am happier and more fulfilled because through that heartache through that separation I have grown and I I have grown to find the Lord all I need and that praise the Lord for that we're not saying that you find happiness by marriage, by divorce, by singlehood. None of those things provide happiness. God gives gifts. They give us joy. But the foundation of our happiness is when we grow to a place where we say, Lord, you are what I need. 
and we grow in life. The Lord, I'm so thankful. He brings us through seasons and he brings beauty from ashes and he brings us to a place of communion with him. And so I'm thankful for that perspective, Lord. Uh, Sister Marcia and Lord, I thank, thank you that you do that for us. Those who wait on the Lord always get his best. Those who insist on getting what they want often end up in heartache. And we know the verse, delight thyself in the Lord. He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Delight yourself in the Lord, and guess what? The happiness will come, not because you're, you're chasing after happiness. You're chasing after him. Um, Jim Elliott said, God always gives his best to those who leave the choice with him. I can't say amen to that enough. Let him do his work, and let whatever season you are in, be what God wants it to be, because it's by design. Um, the quote here, the source of my happiness is not found in or out of any particular marital status. It's not found in any human relationship. True lasting joy cannot be found in anything or anyone other than Christ himself. If we didn't catch that already. All right, life number two in these notes. Um, speaking within marriage, it is my job to change my mates. Okay. We ladies, most of us, some of it depends on personality. Some of it depends on personality, but I think most women are fixers. And this is a strength that God has given us. We have the ability to see what is wrong and know what needs to be fixed and how to fix it. But just like everything else, the devil can take something that is good and twist it to become destructive. And this is something I, oh, this, this really spoke to my heart, that it's not my job to change my mate, just like it's not my mate's job to fix or change me. Um, this can happen when our focus is on his faults and shortcomings. I, I am not, I'm not saying, I'm, it's easy for us to see the shortcomings in our spouse and that can become our focus where we are an expert now on how our husbands need to change. Not only that, it takes our focus away from our own walk with the Lord, you know, because our focus is on the needs that probably are truly there. It's not something we're making up in our minds. So sometimes the, the devil can stir things up as well. But what happens is our focus becomes changing that person rather than, Lord, what are you doing in my life? How do I need to change and grow? This can result in frustration, constant frustration. It can result in that nagging, irritable personality that none of us wanna become. But we can all, we are all very capable of becoming one. Remember the Bible says a contentious woman is like a continual drop. If you have a faucet that just won't turn off, a contentious woman, all of us can be contentious if we're not careful. Wanting to fix. Someone spoke up back here. Who, somebody said something. I don't want to miss it. Anybody? A thought? Okay, I thought I heard something. I am not my husband's mother and I'm not his Holy Spirit. Oh, <laughs> this is profoundly <laughs> practical. Yes. <laughs> Jermaine, because I can't say it, say it again for our Zoom ladies. Oh, I ain't your mom. I ain't your mom, okay? 
Sometimes we need to look at the mirror and say, I ain't his mom. <laughs> and for those of us who are more spiritual, I ain't his Holy Spirit either. <laughs> and sometimes we can fall into that where I, it is my job to speak for the Holy Spirit because for some reason, God is not capable of working his, in his heart on his own. So I need to be the one to do it for God. Okay. We laugh because we have all we have been there. If you're not married, you have someone in your life that this is applying to, right? Let's look at the truth. By the way, the Bible does, no, we're going to talk about it in a minute. I'm not going to segue. Let's look at the truth. A godly life and prayer are a wife's two greatest means of influencing her husband's life. Let's read that again. A godly life and prayer are a wife's two greatest means of influencing her husband's wife, life. James 5.16 says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or a woman availeth much. We cannot discount the power of our prayers for our husbands. If God gives us the insight to see a need, the first place we should go is to our closet to pray. Uh, the Lord convicted me about this. Um, I have not been married long, so I'm not saying, uh, I'm not speaking as, like Sister Merle said, someone who's been married for years and has sage advice. But the Lord convicted me about this two years into our marriage, that I was not laboring for my husband in prayer like I should be. I prayed for him every day, but it was more light prayer and that was when the lord showed me you know what i need to labor in prayer for my husband the things that the lord shows me either are shortcomings or needs or burdens have you ever had a situation where your husband you know something's wrong but they're not sharing it uh, many men process before they share. I process as I share. And it's not right or wrong. It's the way the Lord has wired many of us and many of them. But we, one of our greatest tools is our prayer for our husbands. Laboring in prayer for them. Talking to the one who knows them best. And the one who can communicate with them best. Have you ever thought about the fact that God wired your husband? He created him. He knows how he ticks. So he can communicate with them. And that, to me, is so reassuring. That I can take things to the Lord in prayer. And know that God is hearing and working. But also my godly life. This is an important chat passage, 1 Peter 3, 1 through 4. This deals with a situation where a wife has a husband who is either unsaved or is not right with the Lord. He's not living right. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 4. This passage actually will come up in several of the lies that we're going to be going over even next week. So this is one that's valuable to make a study this week. Verse one, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, and it's talking about any husband that's obeying not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, we now these days we use conversation to be speaking with our words. But does anybody know in the Bible term 
conversation doesn't mean our words. It means what? Our lifestyle, our actions, how we are living. So the end of this verse says, okay, if you have a husband who's not obeying the word, not the, the verse, it's careful to say it's with, that they are one without the word by the conversation of the wives. Verse two, while they behold, how do they behold something? Was it with their ears? With their eyes. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. And I think that fear, it's not a fear of their husbands. It's a respect. Verse three, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning, plating of the hair or wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. We don't change our husbands by uh, changing our looks. Verse four, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. In, with, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, a great price. This passage tells us that if, if we have a husband that is out of line with the Lord for one reason or another, it's not by our constant preaching or nagging or talking to them. It's by the way we live. And only by God's grace, ladies, I know. In, if you're in a difficult home situation, um, and even if you're in a happy home situation, our flesh can take over. And we want to fix it. But we move ahead of God. And by doing that, we can actually hurt what God is trying to do in the heart and life of our, life of our husband. So what we need to be reminded is back away from so much of this and ask God for grace for every day in how we live, how we treat them. I, there's a, a very telling testimonial, and we're almost done with tonight's lesson. Um, this is a husband and wife where the wife got saved before the husband. And the husband has a problem with alcohol and uh, some other issues. Later, he got saved, and they are serving the Lord together. But this was part of his testimony. He said, Chris, his wife, remained respectful of me and never pressed me. She never tried to be the Holy Spirit in my life. I know I would have resisted if she had started preaching at me. What struck me the most was the incredible patience and restraint she showed when it could have been easy for her to lecture, scold, or prod. In hindsight, he knew how hard he was on his wife. And what actually was a testimony to him was that she did not respond in kind. She didn't preach, lecture, lose her patience. Don't treat your husband the way he treats you. Treat him the way God treats you. And leave the rest to the Lord. Let God step in. Let God step in and work. And sometimes it takes time. There was another testimony of the book where it took 16 years the prayer of a wife over specific things, it took 16 years and the light bulb finally came on. That takes grace, ladies. <laughs> it's, I, oh, I'm not saying that to discourage, but I'm saying God is working when you don't see. Let's take advantage of the two tools that are most important, prayer, and a godly life. The example of Mary and Joseph, I had never thought about this. Mary and Joseph, when the angel appeared to Mary, he told her she was going to conceive of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. I mean, she was told some pretty massive things, but an angel was there telling her that 
And so she said, be it unto me according to thy word. Okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you on this. But when she went to tell Joseph, it seems apparent from the word of God that he did not believe her words. Because remember, he, he didn't see the angel. And it says that he was thinking he may need to put her away. Which means he, though she, I'm sure, told him the angel's story, he was assuming that she was unfaithful. But the Bible always also said that Mary kept these things and pondered them in her heart. And who was it that convinced Joseph that Mary was conceive, conceiving of the Holy Ghost? It was an angel in a dream that God sent to him. And what I took from that lesson is there are times when there is a place because the Bible says we are to be a help to our husbands. There is a place where they need and rely on our input and our insight in a respectful, kind manner. But then once that has been spoken, we need to step back and let God communicate with them. Let him do what we cannot do. All right, that's where we're gonna end tonight. Food to chew on for this week, right? And we only can do this through God's grace, but it's, it's encouraging and it's helpful. All right, now we're gonna move on, bring if you, are here in person, try to remember to bring your notes back with you next week. And um, if you forget them, we'll have a few extra here for you, but that will just help that we can bring that back with us. All right, are you all still awake in here? <laughs> Psalm 139. How are we doing on these verses? Coming along slowly but surely. Okay. Don't be discouraged. If you, if you are not to where we have ended, as long as you're making progress, that's the most important thing. You'll be amazed by the end of the class, how much of this passage you'll be able to say. And more importantly, how much has sunk into our heart. So uh, at this time, if you need to leave for other things, we won't hold it against you in any way but you can go ahead and leave. But otherwise, let's practice together, ladies, okay? Psalm 139. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light. All right. And that's me. The darkness and the light. Are, oh, have, did we go on to that verse? Yay. I'm so impressed. Some of you kept going. So let's start again with if I say surely the darkness, okay? If I say surely the darkness shall cover me. Even the night shall be light about me. The darkness, oops, the night. But the light shines as the day. 
the darkness and the light are both alike to me. I need to study this. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Let's let's work on let's work on verse number 12, okay? Yea, which means yes. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee. Actually, it doesn't mean hiding like this, does it? It means it hideth not from thee. That means the darkness cannot hide anything from you, okay? Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee. And then the next phrase, but the night shineth as the day. It's kind of like those night goggles. The night shineth as the day. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The night shineth as the day. The night shineth as the day. Sometimes it's easy to get darkness and light and the night and day. This verse, the night shines as the day. Let's try to put those two phrases again together. Ready? Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the dark the night shines as the day. And then the last phrase, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. This is the sign for a light or the same, right? The darkness and the light are both a light to me. We're going to say it three times. Then I'm going to see if somebody is brave enough just to say that verse. Okay. Here we go. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to me. Does anybody want to try to say it? Or maybe want to partner with someone else to say it together? Sister Merle? Okay, let's listen and support. Be thinking of it as she's saying it. Ready? Yay. <laughs> The darkness and the light are both alike to be very, very good. Anybody else want to try it? There's three parts to this verse. Some of you that were saying it so confidently just a minute ago. I know. I'm not going to pick on to Neil, but she was pretty strong in saying it. <laughs> All right. Now our attention is going to be on our Zoom ladies. Anybody on Zoom that wants to try to say that verse? Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee. Any brave soul out here? They do. Jermaine said, how do we know where they're not looking at their Bible? That's what I was going to say. So that means you won't know. You can, but that's what she was going to say too. We, this is going to be on the honor system. You, you can say it with your eyes closed. Anybody want to try? Okay. Next week, it's on you guys. Okay. okay. Let's try to say it all together, and then we're going to say the whole thing one last time. Okay. What? <laughs> I'm doing. Remember, there's three parts to this verse, and it starts with what word? Okay. Yay. The darkness hideth not with thee. But the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to me. What a wonderful truth. Okay. Both alike to me. All right. Now, let's try to say the whole thing. Try not to look, even if you know there are parts that you don't know. Science tells us if you make your brain struggle for it, you'll remember it better, okay?
So let's try to say it. If you have to say Butterfinger, Butterfinger a few times. <laughs> That's all right. Then you'll catch up on. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Psalm 139. O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar so off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, Behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from me. For the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the night are both alike to thee. Amen. All right. There. Good work. Good, good thinking time. Uh, let's close in prayer and then you all need to get home, get eating, and get to bed. So, who will close us?